Greetings, everyone. Thanks for downloading this latest episode of the China History Podcast. We have another topic today that I'd like to introduce that everyone should be at least acquainted with. I've mentioned them a few times in previous podcasts. I thought before we swing back in the other direction and hang out for a while in modern times, perhaps I should do one more topic from China's ancient days and even pre-ancient days. Today we go back much farther than the Zhou Dynasty kings. Today we go deep into China's legendary past and look at the San Huang Wu Di, the three sovereigns and the five emperors. These eight figures play a big role in ancient Chinese mythology, especially the Yellow Emperor. So I thought before we head back to the 20th century and look at some post-liberation Chinese history. Let's go all the way to the beginning of the beginning, to the three August ones, or sovereigns, or three lords of China's pre-historical period and the five emperors of the ancient historical period. The good news is that these eight sort of come one right after the other, so chronologically they're easy to keep straight. The bad news is there are multiple variations about who comprises the three and who makes up the five. You don't really. Know whom to go with. So we'll sort of look at most of them because it's all not too terribly confusing. And although approximate dates are associated with various persons, the dates aren't that terribly important. This period covers the six or seven hundred years before the Xia Dynasty, of which we only know from legends and from what Sima Qian wrote in the Shi Qi. In all the cultures around the world, they all have their own myths and oral histories about these times. These were the centuries where mankind on Earth were just getting ready to take off. These days, between say 3000 BC and 2000 BC, humankind around the world, who wherever they were, were in varying degrees learning the most basic necessities of life and had obtained the knowledge and skills for survival. In all manners of natural phenomena, were ascribed to various gods and demigods. Now, who am I to say these people, who the Chinese call their ancestors, were made up, or they actually roamed this earth six thousand years ago? Who even knows what happened six hundred years ago, let alone six thousand? If the Chinese consider the San Huang Wu Di to be their most ancient of ancestors, then we should find out who they are, I guess. You know, since we're going this far back, there aren't too many layers before you get to Pan Gu. So, although he is not a member of this team, the San Huang Wu Di. Let's just briefly introduce him. To the best of my knowledge, in all of anything that has to do with China, there is nothing older than Pan Gu. Although this is more mythology than history, it all starts with Pan Gu. Pan Gu was born in an egg that contained the universe. The egg and the egg shape is found in many cosmologies. China uses it too. After eighteen thousand years. The egg hatched into two pieces, and then over another hundred and eighty centuries, Pan Gu separated the two halves of the egg into the heavens and the earth below. Eventually, everything was in balance between the Yang of heaven with the Yin of earth. Pan Gu dies afterwards, and his physical remains were scattered about the earth. And this is the Chinese version of what the Bible said happened on days number five and six. All life on Earth came into being. Pan Gu is by no means a god with a small or a large G. Let's just say, in the Chinese mythological creation, it all happened with some great beginning, and Pan Gu sort of went along for the ride and helped to facilitate the formation of the heavens and the earth, and then all life on Earth. This is just one version of the myth of Pan Gu. The creation of the Chinese land. And of the people, I don't want to get bogged down in too many details about all the various versions. Suffice to say, for our purposes today, first there was Pan Gu, and then there was Nü Wa, who also gets credit for creating the human race. Nü Wa is associated with a lot of myths in China, and plays multiple roles and has multiple powers. She's often associated with the god king Fu Shi. In some versions of the myth, Nü Wa is the daughter of the Jade Emperor. You remember him, I hope, from our Taoism Part Three podcast. There's more agreement on who the five emperors were than with the three sovereigns. In some versions, and certainly Sima Qian's version, 
There were three August ones called Tian Huang, Di Huang, and Tai Huang. In English, we'd say the Heavenly Sovereign, the Earthly Sovereign, and、uh, I guess the Tai Sovereign. Sima Qian aside, most sources I ran across consider Fu Xi, Shen Nong, and the Yellow Emperor Huang Di to be the three. So let's look at them. Pan Gu aside, the most ancient of the ancients is Fu Xi. His sister and/or wife was Nuwa. Fu Xi and Nuwa are slotted around 2800 BC. It was they who, with the permission of the Jade Emperor, procreated and created the human race after floods had wiped out everything and everyone. You can see in these lands along the Yellow River so many flood-related legends. The Yellow River so dominated the lives of. Those who were affected by it over the centuries, Nuwa also used her magical powers to fashion humans out of clay. So this is how they were able to mass produce the human race, rather than, you know, doing it the long way. Nuwa is very important. Nuwa is a very important person in Chinese mythology for all kinds of matters relating to a man and a woman, particularly in any and all matters of marriage. Fu Xi. Brought humanity to humankind, and taught man how to make nets, how to fish, and along with、uh, Tang Jie later on is credited with teaching man how to write. He also gets general credit for teaching mankind how to survive and do basic things. He is said to have first taught mankind about silkworms and their bountiful yield. His time again、uh, was around the 2800s BC or thereabouts. He's also credited with creating the eight trigrams, the Ba Gua, and some say he wrote the I Ching, and not King Zhou Wen, who we discussed last time, the father of Zhou Gong. The old tradition that a man and a woman of the same surname cannot marry also is traced back to this first of the San Huang. San means three, Huang, king or sovereign. Next up is Shen Nong. Shen Nong's time would be about、eh, the 2700s BC. This is before the Great Flood and about a hundred years or so before the Great Pyramid was built. This was when Stonehenge was built. Cuneiform writing was just now appearing for the first time in Mesopotamia, but there was nothing like that unearthed in China yet to corroborate the existence of Shen Nong nor any of the San Huang Wu Di. He is also referred to as Yan Di, although. Some say Yan Di was totally separate from Shen Nong. Yan means flame or fire, so Shen Nong is also referred to as the Fire Emperor or Flame Emperor. He's considered by most to be the second of the San Huang or Three Sovereigns, as his name suggests, which can mean Divine Farmer. He is the one most credited with teaching agriculture to the Chinese people. Nong Ye. Means agriculture. Nong Min are the farmers. So Shen Nong Shen means divine, and Nong means pertaining to agriculture. Because of the work written long after he was said to have lived, the Shen Nong Ban Cao Jing or Shen Nong's Herb Root Classic, he is also credited with being the father of Chinese medicine, or at least herbal medicine. This automatically made Shen Nong the patron saint of all herbalists and pharmacists. Acupuncture is also something that some legends say Shen Nong gave to the Chinese people. In 2737 BC, it said, this god of the five grains or god of agriculture and stalwart of Chinese culture brought tea to mankind and taught the Chinese all the medicinal and health benefits of tea drinking. Following Shen Nong was, of course, the last of the San Huang, and this was the famous. Yellow Emperor. Of the three mythical San Huang, it's the Yellow Emperor more than Fu Xi or Shen Nong, who is considered the father of the Hua Xia or the Chinese people, and in fact the entirety of Chinese civilization in general. The Hua Xia people were made up of all these individual tribes that stretched all along the winding Yellow River in Henan, Shanxi, and Shandong. These Hua Xia were all united. And became the Han people, who today make up over ninety percent of all people living in China. And it's the Yellow Emperor who brought all the various tribes and clans of the Yellow River Valley under his control and unified all of these people into a single culture. 
The Yellow Emperor is the only one of the three who has a full name. That is, Gongsun Xuanyuan. The Yellow Emperor is also credited with advancing silk farming techniques and how to make clothes from silk. Well, he gets credit for this, but one story is that he had a wife and three concubines. It was the wife of the Yellow Emperor who taught about silk farming and weaving skills, and one concubine invented chopsticks, and another the comb. I couldn't find what the third one did, except to say that she was not that great looking, but the Emperor favored her. Other things credited to the Yellow Emperor, the wheel, armor, weapons, ships, a money system, the compass, and writing. That's the third one already, trying to glom some credit for inventing Chinese characters. The Yellow Emperor's period was somewhere around the 2600s BC. This would be just about the time the old kingdom of Egypt was starting to get cranked up. Unfortunately, in China at least, these were the days where nothing has been found yet that can tell us anything to support these myths. He's called the Yellow Emperor due to the yellow period of this time. You had the five elements, the Wu Xing of wood, fire, earth, metal, water. This, along with the Yi Jing and other things, were all part of the Taoism that became so enmeshed with traditional Chinese folk culture. He's a major patron saint of Taoism. The Yellow Emperor's time was the earth period, and in the five elements, yellow was the color associated with earth. All the five elements were linked to everything, and they all had a specific color associated with them. So he was called the Yellow Emperor. The Yellow Emperor came from around Chufu, a city we mentioned last time in our Duke of Zhou episode. Chufu was the capital of Zhou Gong's patrimonial state of Lu, and also later during the time of the Eastern Zhou was the birthplace of Confucius. You just can't say anything bad about the Yellow Emperor. Much of what is credited to Fu Xi and Shan Nong is also credited to the Yellow Emperor. The times of the Yellow Emperor were good times. It was believed in these days, still several centuries before the Great Floods, that there was peace, and the Yellow Emperor, through his own means and his influence, brought great peace and prosperity to the Chinese people, and he's held up as a paragon of virtue and wisdom. And for this, and for all he did for China up to that time, he was immortalized and became a god of Chinese mythology. And to this day, references can be found in all kinds of popular Chinese culture where the Chinese call themselves the sons and grandsons of the Yellow Emperor. Another landmark accomplishment attributed to the Yellow Emperor was the Huangdi Neijing. This is the Yellow Emperor's inner canon, or classic. This is the granddaddy of them all, or the original, oldest Chinese source from which all knowledge about Chinese medicine came. It's divided up into the Su Wen and the Ling Shu, and it's here where the most basic questions of the day regarding human health and acupuncture were discussed. You can visit the tomb of the Yellow Emperor. Sima Qian says he's buried there, and King Wu, brother of the Venerable Duke of Zhou says he's buried there, too. It's two and a half hours north of Xi'an up the G210 highway. Let me say, it's on my uh, list of places to go visit when I have time. Now, the Yellow Emperor is also taken by some to be one of the five emperors rather than one of the three sovereigns. The important thing to know, as you can tell already, there's no single, clean-cut, authoritative, Edith Hamilton, Tales of Greek Mythology order about all this. It's all very interesting, but there are multiple versions of almost everything I have said, and who knows what to believe. But you can see with these three mythical sovereigns, all the basics of a settled civilization, including all the necessary tools required for a people to grow food, are given by these powerful and wise people who were part god and part king. Moving right along, the first of the five emperors was Shao Hao. Though, as I said, there are those who had other ideas. He was said to be the son of the Yellow Emperor and reigned in the 2500s BC at his capital in Chufu. His tomb is also there, and it's an additional sight to see of that ancient and important city in China. Very 
slim pickings on this emperor. So we're going to move straight into his nephew, Zhuan Xu, who reigns sort of 2500 to 2400 BC. Everyone is mostly in agreement that Zhuan Xu was the second of the Wu Di, or five emperors. He was a grandson of the Yellow Emperor. Again, like his predecessor, Zhuan Xu doesn't have much that's written about him, though he is said to have particularly made contributions to astronomy and the calendar. He was followed by Ku, who was the great-grandson of the Yellow Emperor. He was 2400s, 2300s BC. Now we're getting into the time of Noah and the biblical flood, which, as we know, matches the times of the great floods in China and Yu the Great. So, Shao Hao, Zhuan Xu, and Ku. Not a whole lot to say. But the final two of the mythical Wu Di, or five emperors, were Yao and Shun. Yao was the son of Ku. When we speak of the San Huang Wu Di, the three sovereigns and five emperors, I sort of draw the line right here, beginning with Yao, where, although there isn't any hard historical evidence, Yao is a definite maybe, as far as having ever lived. Yao and Shun, although mythical, well, let's just say they used to say the same thing about Troy until Heinrich Schliemann came along. What is important about Emperor Yao is that first he stood for the ultimate, upright, morally perfect, model, benevolent emperor from which forevermore Chinese would point to throughout history. For all the emperors to follow, from Qin Shi Huang to Pu Yi, Yao was always held up as the model emperor, and of course Confucius always held Yao in the highest esteem. The Chinese chess game of Wei Qi was invented by Yao, it said. He was the first to hand the crown to the most worthy, rather than just passing it on to a possibly no-good son. In Yao's case, he had some disappointing sons, one named Dan Zhu or, and another Shang Jun. When it came time to abdicate, he did it in favor of his son-in-law Shun instead. Shun was married to both of Yao's daughters, E Huang and Nu Ying, and for this, Yao was repeatedly the target of endless assassination attempts by his own father and stepbrother, but it's his daughters who time and again save Yao's life, or so the legend goes. And if you vaguely recall from recent podcasts on the Mid-Autumn Festival, it was Yao who called on Ho Yi to deal with the ten burning hot suns, and Ho Yi shot nine of them down, killing them and earning the eternal wrath of the god of the eastern sun, Di Jun. However, Yao didn't look on this as such a bad thing, so we see the origins of Mid-Autumn Festival to the time of Yao. There were what was known as the Three Sage Kings. These were Yao, Shun, and Yu, Yu being the founder of the Xia Dynasty and the one who was called the Great for his taming of the floods. These came in quick succession, one after the other. So it's with Yao and Shun, and of course Yu the Great, that the myths start to emulsify into a kind of a recorded history. So although this is a mythical time period in Chinese history, let's just say it's less mythical than the times of Fu Xi to Ku. Shun, as I said, was considered another great sage king. His accomplishments were in setting up the basic organization of society, how land was divided up, what rituals, sacrifices were necessary. The stories of Shun's Filial devotion, his humility, and industry make up a good part of his legend. So that's the San Huang Wu Di, the three sovereigns, Fu Xi, Shen Nong, and the Yellow Emperor, and the five emperors, Shao Hao, Zhuan Xu, Ku, Yao, and Shun. Also part of the whole San Huang Wu Di myth are Pan Gu and Nu Wa. These old mythological figures from China's prehistory days are considered the earliest kings who laid all the foundations from which sprung the Xia, Shang, and later the Zhou. As I have said several times, there were no Sima Qians during their time who dutifully recorded all their exploits and achievements. All that we know of these days prior to the 18th century BC are simply legends and second- and third-hand accounts of events that can hardly be counted on as having happened. But all the same, at least the main ones, the Yellow Emperor, Yao, and Shun, 
these are still very critical and important figures from Chinese culture, and you could see them wherever Chinese calendars might hang, in paintings, scrolls, and in every imaginable form of carved figurine or statue. They may never have lived, but that doesn't mean they're not important. So, that's it on these guys. This is Laszlo Montgomery coming to you, as I've done a couple times before, from the lovely upper house in Hong Kong. Yes, true to my word, I'm already in the middle of my first trip for this month, and I'm enjoying a nice respite in my home here for nine years, eating well and enjoying the nice Hong Kong October weather. Next time, I'm planning to go back to modern days, or at least no later than the Qing Dynasty. But maybe we'll look at some Jiefang Yihou de Zhongguo Lishi, or Chinese history that took place after liberation in 1949. I'm back home in Claremont this Saturday, and if all goes well, we'll all be together next week for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast. Take care, everyone.